IPFS is awesome! It's a revolutionary project to create a true decentralized internet. It could one day replace HTTP and even be used on Mars. No matter if you are Web3, Web2 or God forbid a Java developer, you have to know about IPFS. In this video, I will explain what is IPFS, how does it work and how you can use it in your application. Have you ever wondered if it's possible to download a movie on Mars? Me neither! But fortunately, thanks to IPFS aka the interplanetary file system, the answer is yes! IPFS is a decentralized file system. You can use it to upload and download files such as text, pictures or videos. Technically, IPFS is a peer-to-peer -peer network. To participate in the network, you have to run a software called an IPFS client and anybody can join the network, there isn't any centralized authority. Ok, but we already have peer-to-peer -peer networks like BitTorrent. If you never pirated content on BitTorrent, give a like to this video! Mm, well, I guess I'm not gonna get a lot of likes this way, let's try again. If you already pirated anything on BitTorrent, give a like to this video! Ah, much better! But what about IPFS? IPFS is much more ambitious than existing peer-to-peer -peer networks. IPFS wants to be a fundamental piece of infrastructure to build decentralized applications. Decentralized applications? Wait a second, don't we already have the blockchain technology to build decentralized applications? Yes, but it's very expensive to store large volume of data on the blockchain. That's why many quote-unquote decentralized applications actually use centralized servers for a big part of the application. Not great. Can we do better? Yes. With IPFS, you can store a lot of data in a decentralized way at a much cheaper cost than with blockchain. So you can see IPFS and blockchain not as competitors, but as two complementary technologies to build decentralized applications. Ok, so now we're gonna focus on how IPFS work. And we're going to start with something very important called content addressing. On the internet, when you want to access a website, you say, hey internet, give me the resource at this location. You specify the location, not the resource. That's what we call location-based addressing. And technically, we use an URL that maps to a location, the IP address. But on IPFS, it's different. When you want a resource on IPFS, you say, hey IPFS, give me this resource. You specify the resource, not the location. That's what we call content-based addressing. And technically, we do this with an identifier called CID. It's a string of character that looks like this. The CID is the equivalent of an URL, but with IPFS. Ok, so with an URL, anybody can pick what they want, like phpsuck.com. But how does it work with CIDs? It's completely different. A CID is based on the cryptographic hash of the data. You can see this as a digital fingerprint. It uniquely identifies a specific piece of data. And it's computed by IPFS every time you upload a new file. But there is something strange. If anybody can upload anything to IPFS, who is going to pay for data storage? The data needs to be stored somewhere and it costs money. The solution is simple. In the IPFS network, everybody decides which file they want to store. To upload a file to IPFS, you need to run an IPFS client on your computer. When you first upload it, it will be put in the cache. But it's only temporary. If it's not requested in the next few days, it will be deleted. But what if you want to keep some files forever? It's possible, but you need to explicitly instruct IPFS to keep these files. That's what we call the pinning feature. But what if you want to download a file from IPFS? If the file is stored in your IPFS clients, it's easy, you already have the data. Otherwise, we need to download the data from other computers in the network. But wait a second, how can your client know where is the data? We need something like a catalog. And this is exactly the purpose of the distributed hash table or just DHT. This is the secret sauce that makes IPFS possible. So pay attention. The DHT is a catalog of all the data available on IPFS. It tells you who knows what. It's a dictionary with two columns. The left column contains CIDs, the identifiers for the data, and the right column contains PIDs, the identifier of other network participants. But there is a problem. The DHT is huge. It cannot fit on a single computer. We need to split it across the network. How are we going to do this? For this, we need to understand PIDs. When an IPFS client starts for the first time, it will generate a PID. 
that's a string of characters that uniquely identifies each computer that runs IPFS. In theory, it's possible that two different IPFS clients generate the same peer ID, but the chance is so small that it will never happen in our lifetime. And there is something else that you have to know about peer ID. They are generated using a random number generator, and this generator creates random numbers with an even distribution. This is very interesting, because it means we can expect the PIDs to also have an even distribution. And you will understand later why it's important. Another important concept is that we can generate these peer IDs in the same range of number as the CIDs. Even though peer IDs and CIDs are string of characters, we can easily map these characters to numbers. To represent our DHT, you can visualize an axis of numbers, representing the different CIDs, and also representing the different peer IDs. The final important concept is distance. Using a special function, we can calculate a distance between two points in the DHT. And we do this by using the XOR function. If you never heard of the XOR function, that's a logical operation where output bits are set to 1 if only one of the input bits are set to 1. But why do we care about this distance? Because we can use it to determine who must know what. We can decide a rule where every client must store all the records of the DHT below a certain distance. And since the peer IDs are distributed evenly, we are sure that we will cover the whole DHT. Ok, so with the DHT, we know how to break down our giant catalog of data across the whole IPFS network. But how can we use this catalog? Good question. When a client wants to find the location of a piece of data, it will look at the list of peer IDs that is known, contact the closest peer ID to the CID, ask it if it knows about this CID, and if not, return any peer ID closer to the CID. And by repeating this algorithm, at some point, you will find the right peer ID. Clever, huh? But don't thank me, I didn't create anything. What I just described here is called the Cadenlea hash table. Ok, so let's recap what we have learned so far. There are two kinds of data in IPFS. The actual content stored on IPFS like images, videos, etc. This is like a warehouse. And the metadata which says who has what. This is like a catalog. For each category, it's too big to keep on a single computer, so we need to split it across a network. Each IPFS client can decide which content to store. However, when it comes to the metadata, it's the IPFS protocol that decides who store what. And finally, there is an algorithm to find the missing part of the metadata, which ultimately allows any client to download any content from IPFS. So now you're a pro of distributed hash table and IPFS. Congrats! But we still have some important topics to cover. If IPFS just wanted to be an alternative to BitTorrent, we could stop there. But IPFS is much more ambitious. It wants to be the future of internet. IPFS wants to be able to represent not only files, but also directories or any kind of linked data. That's why on IPFS, data is represented by a tree-like structure called a Merkle DAG. Each element of this data structure is an IPFS object. It's like a JSON file with a data field representing the actual data and a links field representing an optional array of related IPFS objects. And the whole object is identified by a CID based on the hash of the data. So here is how a file is processed. First, IPFS chunks the data into blocks of 256 kilobytes maximum. Then IPFS computes the hash for each block. Then each block is turned into an IPFS object. And finally, a top IPFS object is added without any data but with links to the other objects. This is what we call a Merkle DAG. And if you want to experiment with Merkle DAG, you can check out this tool. You just have to upload a file and it will simulate how IPFS breaks down the file into a Merkle DAG. Wow! I know that Merkle DAGs can be intimidating, but the gist of it is that the data is organized in a tree structure which gives IPFS the flexibility to store many kind of data. Ok, so next we are going to tackle something easier. What if you publish something by mistake on IPFS? Or what if you just want to remove some outdated data? Can we delete data from IPFS? Well, yes and no. You can remove a file from an IPFS client that you control. 
But if the file has already been copied to other nodes in the network, it's too late. The data is already out there. Next, we are going to talk of something very important, security. Here is a $1 million question. Should you trust other computers on the IPFS network? Possible answers. Yes, after all, the open source community is very nice. Yes, because only trusted participants run the IPFS network. It depends. No. Tick tac, tick tac. And the correct answer is A. No, I'm kidding. Of course, it's D. You cannot trust anybody. But you know what? It doesn't matter because with content addressing, you can always verify the data that you receive. All you have to do is compute the CID for each block that you receive and compare it with the CID that you requested. If they match, you are good. And behind the hood, IPFS does this check for you. That's what we call an integrity test. So IPFS is super cool, but does anybody use it? Yes. And I'm going to show you some examples of real applications that use IPFS. DTube is a YouTube clone. The content is hosted on IPFS and the important business logic is on the blockchain. Uniswap is a famous blockchain application to buy and sell tokens. Their main frontend is hosted on a centralized server, but they also do separate deployments on IPFS, which allows anyone to access Uniswap. This is very important because in the past, Uniswap was forced by the US government to block the frontend to some countries like Iran. With the frontend deployed on IPFS, anybody can use it without any restrictions. And finally, another big use case of IPFS is NFTs. Pictures of NFTs are too big to be stored on the blockchain. Some projects store them on centralized servers, but it breaks the decentralization promise of crypto. That's why some other project decided to use IPFS to host these images instead. And this is just the beginning. In the future, we will see many more use cases. Every time you want to store some static assets in a decentralized way, IPFS is a great choice. Text, video, photo, or even the front end of a website with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And remember, it's used both for blockchain applications, but also non-blockchain applications. So now you are an expert in IPFS. Or almost. You are probably wondering, okay, this is great, but how can I use it in my app? I'm glad you asked. A first way to use IPFS in your app is to use Helia. This is a JavaScript implementation of IPFS that can run in a browser. But it's quite complex to use and you might not want to run an IPFS node in your app. But fortunately, QuickNode is here to save us. QuickNode has a very simple to use REST API for IPFS. With QuickNode, you can simply upload content, read content, and also create a custom gateway to IPFS. And on top of it, QuickNode also has a very good blockchain API if you also need to access a blockchain network like Ethereum. So next, go create a free account on QuickNode and experiment with IPFS. I put the link down below. Thanks for watching, see you next time.